Hi folks, I'm Mike Medea, Head of Education Programs at the American Philosophical Society, or the APS. Haven't watched one of our career chats yet? That's okay. If you have, thanks for being part of our community. If you need a quick introduction to the APS though, be sure to check out our website or follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So, we're here to discuss the many careers offered by an organization like the APS. As a museum, research library, archive, and membership society, we have great staff who do work ranging from administration to publications. Career Chats showcases these staff members and introduces you to careers you might not have considered before. I ask the staff members a series of questions during these interviews. If you've seen the page for the series and have a question about a certain career, be sure to submit one. We'd love to hear from you. Now that you have some basics, enjoy learning about APS staff and their careers. Hi folks, thanks for joining on today's episode of Career Chats. I am truly honored to be joined by Val Lutz, the Head of Manuscript Processing at the APS. How are you doing today, Val? Good, good. Pretty good. How are you, Mike? Doing pretty well, you know. Finally fall, so I'm excited. Well, <laughs> I'm yeah, excited. relatively speaking. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so, Val, if you want to kick things off with, uh, with just repeating your name and title and kind of jump into what you do at the APS. Sure. Um, my name is Val Lutz, uh, Valerie Lutz, Head of Manuscripts Processing. Um, I supervise a team of four archivists and we arrange and describe manuscript collections and um, create online finding aids to make them more accessible to researchers. And uh, we also handle a lot of reference and a little bit of everything, whatever needs to be done. But um, the, the main focus is manuscripts processing. That makes a lot of sense. I, I like the little pitch of like pretty much anything that needs to be done falls yeah. off. <laughs> we all do. We all do. <laughs> yeah. Which is great. Um, I think this is a rare case too. So how do you describe what you do to your friends? What I usually say is that we organize and describe the papers of scientists, anthropologists, historians, and various other folks um, and create online guides to make them more available for researchers. And that kind of boils it down. Now, some people think that sounds like really cool, like, oh, I'd love to do that. And they think it's really funny. I get to read all day. That doesn't necessarily happen. And, uh, but then there are a lot of folks who think it sounds really boring too. But, um, you know, overall, I mean, I think most people think it sounds like a cool job. So. Hey, I definitely do. When, as soon as yeah. you said organize and describe, I was on board. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> some of us really love that kind of thing. So. Uh, and so does that work tend to be solo or as a team? Um, it's kind of a combination, actually. It's, um, I would say that I, most of my work is done solo. Well, right now it's very physically <laughs> solo. Clearly, you know, we all are, or a lot of us are. Um, but in, um, but I do interact with a lot of staff. I mean, we, uh, most of us work in the reading room. And so we work with the researchers. And I'm usually always interacting with other staff on site. And even now, I mean, even while working from home. Um, I'm constantly interacting with other staff by email, usually email, which is what I prefer, but um, also Zoom, like we're doing now, <laughs> and uh, occasionally telephone, some staff prefer the phone, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly still interacting with researchers. So it's, it's primarily, oddly enough, despite all of what I just said, it is solo in the sense that anything that requires entering data, working on reports, and analyzing you know, data sheets and things like that, that's done solo. And I would say that even before the pandemic, I used to try to focus on site on the work that I couldn't do off site. I can't take collections home with me. I can't take the staff home with me. I mean, unless they come home for coffee or something, you know, but, um, but so I would do that on the one on site. And then I spent a lot of time, not that we have to do this, but uh, evenings and weekends sort of focusing on reports and data and things like that. So yeah, the things anyway, that don't require yeah, the, the actual right, collections. Yeah. Um, and, and I like that too, because I think it also hints at something that I often think of when it comes to your department in that uh, the, the work itself, like the actual work is solo, but then right, yeah. by being in an organization, that makes it teamwork in a, in a sense. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. So it's the best of both worlds I mean, yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, which is great. Um, so how long have you been with the APS? Uh, 21 years. 21 years. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really, I did not see that when I came here. I mean, I, I was sort of ambivalent for many reasons. It, I won't get into that now if you'd like to follow up on that. It, so it was kind of a culture shock coming to APS from the Philadelphia City Archives mm -hmm. and Temple University. But, um, yeah, but I, it really grew on me. And I mean, the collections are wonderful and the people were Great. So yeah, 21 years. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, um, Mary has been here for almost 20 years, 21 years for you. So I think it's a good sign, at least 
the interviews this season of being able to stay in an organization for a long amount of time, which is always great to hear um, right, and yeah. an important point to consider. Uh, so you hinted at it, but what did you do before working at the APS? Sure. Um, yeah, immediately before APS. Um, I was working at the Philadelphia City Archives. I started there with an internship. Uh, I think we'll probably get into that a little later. Um, and so I was there for, I guess, a total of about a year and a half or two years. And I was also volunteering at the National Archives, uh, which used to be in Center City, Philadelphia, and Thomas Jefferson University Archives. So I, I guess that, that by the time I came to APS, I had two years of archival experience overall. And uh, prior to that, I worked in restaurants, retail offices, um, campus jobs, all sorts of things. So I had kind of a wide variety of experience. I worked at a newspaper for a while. I was a reporter and I was what they called at the time a scanner. I think they didn't know what else to call it. And just in brief, this was back in the days when people would submit paper documents. And uh, the OCR was really bad. If it wasn't 12 point courier, it wouldn't go through. So I would have to fix it. And I finally said, look, I type quickly, let me just key it in and that was my job essentially. But um, yeah, uh, I would say it all was really great experience for what I'm doing now though. I don't know if you want me to get into that at all, but uh, no. even, yeah. <laughs> but like, I, I think so many things that you talked about too, as far as like building transferable skills where, um, especially now, I think anybody reviewing resumes or like talking to people for interviews here, restaurant, customer service, uh, like any sort of retail things are like, great, you can talk to people, you can talk to people in the pinch, you can talk to people under pressure. Right awesome yes please and then like being able to type quickly is still a massive skill that everyone yes definitely. <laughs> <laughs> it is i mean you know i would say they're the two greatest things the typing quickly and even the busiest day at aps is nothing compared to restaurants and retail yep. so it was definitely yep. good preparation yeah goodness yes i i wholeheartedly agree yes <laughs> uh, so going from all of those things how did you first learn or hear about um, this kind of field of work Let's see. Um, when I was, let's see, I, I didn't know about archival work per se. I would say it was probably when I uh, took uh, Martin Levitt's Archives of Manuscripts class at Temple. Um, I was already work researching archives at that point. I mean, I was um, in Temple's Master of History uh, program, and I was researching at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and Temple's Urban Archives, which is now part of Special Collections there. And I was planning my course selection for the spring, and I saw this course, Archives and Manuscripts, and I was registered for something else the same night, and I was like, hmm. So I decided, you know, I'm just going to take a chance. And I went down to APS. I really didn't know where it was. I didn't know anything about <laughs> APS. And I came down there, and we had the class in the boardroom, the APS boardroom, which was very impressive. And the teacher was just, the professor was really great. I mean, mm -hmm. Martin Levitt was, he, he made archives sound so interesting, and it was, it, it was just one of the best classes I'd ever been in, and so the decision was easy. I mean, that, that night I decided I'm um, dropping the course I was going to take, and I'm taking archives and manuscripts. So that's how I first heard about the profession, basically. That, that is so fun, too. I, I, I love that idea of, like, if it sparks your interest, why not just try it out? It's right. one day at worst, and, like, then maybe you get to go to a cool place and meet some other people. So right. it's so, so oh, worth exactly. following that curiosity for a little bit, at least. I know, and it changed my life. I mean, definitely, it was like, <laughs> it's like in a real weird way, that one night. I mean, yeah, it has, right? Which is so great. Yeah. Um, so, so what are the education and experience expectations for a job like yours? Um, usually to come in at the entry level, sadly okay. enough. Um, you usually, um, the expectation is usually a master's degree in either history or um, another, you know, another related subject, one of the mm -hmm. humanities. Uh, or a master's in liberal arts, or not liberal arts, I almost had that, a master's in library science. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I came into the field with a master's in, well, just three credits short of a master's in history, and I completed it during the first few months okay. here. Um, there are some positions, though, like, say, library technical assistant, which technically was what I came in mm -hmm. to APS as. Um, sometimes uh, you can get a position like that with a bachelor's degree. So, um, but uh, for the more advanced positions in the field, a lot of times, believe it or not, and this sounds really awful, uh, two masters sometimes can be expected. <laughs> so it just depends on where, which direction you want to go in. Um, in short, I would say the masters in history is good for the subject matter expertise and for getting the research skills and interacting with researchers. The Master of Library Science, especially if you focus on digital libraries like mm -hmm. I did, that's really great for not only sort of learning reference interactions and the tech library technology, metadata, but um, 
you know, sort of being able to advance in the technical side of things. So it's really your decision. I, I would recommend to anyone thinking about it, don't do two degrees right away. I mean, focus on one at a time and then decide once you get in the field whether you need that second degree. Sometimes you can gain those additional skills on the job. Right, and sometimes the, or like the content knowledge, either one kind of come afterwards too. Right. Um, yeah. It depends on what your own personal interests are. So that, that is a great point. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Val, yeah. especially thinking about that. Um, so other than possibly needing two master's degrees, what would you yeah. say <laughs> are the pros and cons of a job like yours? Yeah, um, let's see. Yes, don't go into too much depth. Let's not do that. But the, per <laughs> the person calls. It's always <laughs> important to think about that. How much money do you yes. spend to earn the money? Uh, yes. Exactly, yes. Exactly. But the actual pros and cons of the job, I would say um, the pros are definitely the ability to learn something new every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't say that half joking, we have seriously, but I think that's what we all love about this field. Um, and uh, yeah, the ability to work with all these great people and we learn a lot just from all the great people we work with so i would say those are definitely the pros of, and we're getting paid for this so i mean to learn more and work with really great people um the cons i would say are kind of the reverse side of that i mean there's so many great collections and while we can look at them while we're processing or while we're digitizing mm -hmm. or writing about them there's just so much that we can never look at, you know, look at or read in their entirety. I mean, I remember when I was younger, looking up at the, the books in the college library and thinking, I'll never read all of these. And I feel the same way every day now. So it's sort of this constant, yeah. And, um, but it's, uh, uh, that's a definitely a con and sort of on a related note, um, that there are so many projects on which I would really love to work, but we, you know, we just don't have the time. And so we have to focus on some and, pass some along to our colleagues and the important thing is that they all get done and I, I get to live vicariously by talking with my colleagues about the projects they're working on so that's uh, it, it's, it, it, even, the, even the cons are not really cons compared to a lot of mm -hmm. other positions. So. But I, and that's so important to think about too I think in, so, in some ways where the reasons why somebody might fall in love with a job of like the, the curiosity being able to learn more constantly being able to do these things can also be the same kind, same side of a different coin in some senses of like that curiosity might come to bite you at some point in time where you, yes. <laughs> you also need to be like disciplined and focused and like get to those kinds of points like you mentioned. Right. Um, yeah. So it's good to think about, right? Like it's <laughs> realizing that kind of um, sense of things. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, so how do you see your field changing in the next 10 years? Um, let's see. Well, part of my response is going to be pretty predictable. I mean, I definitely see more of a move toward digital records. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we all know that. And um, I, I also see, though, um, sort of more of a demand for uh, searchability and ease of access. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are used to searching for things on Google or, say, even genealogists are used to searching Ancestry.com, you know, keyword searching, all this kind of thing. And I mean, certainly we've made great advances and I mean, the Center for Digital Scholarship does an excellent job making collections available, but uh, I'm thinking that the field will probably change in some ways in terms of not throwing traditional archival practice out completely, but I think we need to revisit finding aids mm -hmm. and sort of the uh, how people can uh, access content and sort of work more in conjunction with the folks who are, you know, working on our digital library and the museum and sort of trying to find ways to bring these collections together. Uh, they're currently arranged in, you know, by provenance, say manuscript mm -hmm. collections, but we don't want people to lose it, lose out on all of the cool books or museum objects yeah. that may be related. So I, I think all of us are going to have to work together and, you know, uh, collaboratively a lot more over the next few years. And um, also the other change I, I see happening even now, but slowly, but it's for, definitely for the better. I see you know, the field moving toward having more diverse representation of population mm -hmm. and, um, you know, people from different backgrounds coming to work in not just APS specifically, but cultural institutions in general. I mean, the movement is really slow, as I think a lot of us have noticed. And I think that happens with a lot of sort of these long institutions with long established histories stretching back hundreds of years. But um, I definitely in the field as a whole see a lot more openness, transparency, willingness to consider new ideas, different points of view. Right. And I mean, that's a definite change for the better that I've seen over the past 23 years since I've, uh, yeah. So I, I, I overall, I, I see the field becoming much better, more collaborative, more mm -hmm. open and diverse and looking forward to that. I'm 
glad I was in the field long enough to see this. Yeah, and there, there's so much to unpack and like bring out with, with that response, which is so fantastic. Um, where one, like we ask like, every single time in these interviews is your work tend to be solo or as a team. And that's something to think about as you might like start your undergrad career or like in high school thinking about careers, that those things might change. Like you said, your work might become more collaborative in the future based on how things might be searched or the access to this collection. So you might say one thing now and <laughs> it yeah. might change in 10 years. Um, but also the, the kind of, I guess the the softer side of the softer side of careers where like the representation within those fields should and we really truly do hope changes yes <laughs> so yes. anyways become far more representative than it is right now um yeah. and we hope that this kind of these conversations can be part of that where things like searchability access to the collections change based on who's kind of um keying in those terms and thinking about how that infrastructure works and that gets better the more diverse the representation on the backside of that changes so um thank you for bringing up those points val yeah oh. yeah <laughs> oh, no. um, so we'll switch into the second section to talk a little bit more about the, the history of Val <laughs> and oh, <okay>. how, how <laughs> you discovered sure. a career like this. Um, so we'll jump right in with what were you like in high school? Okay, let's see. In some ways, I, I was rethinking this after my original thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I actually probably was very similar to the way I am now, although that was a really long time ago for me. <laughs> so I've changed a lot for the better, I like to think. But um, the one thing that has remained constant is that I had too many interests and not enough time. And mm -hmm. I I tended to develop sort of an obsessive interest in things and I would sort of want to focus on that to the exclusion of all else and that didn't always coincide with what I was taking in school so um, sometimes my grades were really good and sometimes not so good so there was that and I spent a lot of time in libraries and bookstores and I mean in some ways I was the typical library nerd. Um, I also had maybe little bit of chafing at rules and regulations mm -hmm. though. Um, in my high school, we just, I won't get into this too much in depth, but the one policy that really annoyed me is that you, they required a pass to go to the library. So I developed creative means, I know, and you had to be working on something for a course. And the teacher would say, well, what are you working on for my class? So I would come up with all these sort of reasons why I was going to the library, but I would really be going there to read my own things, you know, whether I was interested in 60s popular culture or, you know, uh, you know, something from the 1950s or the 1968, you know, events of 1968 or whatever. And I, so I had a lot of interest in history at that time, mostly 20th century history. But um, so, you know, the interest in history is definitely still there. I was interested in photography, which I still am. And um, I used to do a lot of things like comparing then and now photographs, walking around town, looking at buildings and comparing. I put together a history book I, when I was a kid. I, did, I, I loved libraries, but I did not, oddly enough, like talking to librarians, and, <laughs> which is kind of strange now that I think about it. But um, the, one to, the first time I really had to interact with the librarians was when I wanted to see old photos of the town. And of course, old photos are not laying around in the stacks. So I had to approach the librarians and they turned out to be really nice people and they showed me the old photos, they Xeroxed them and I put together sort of a very basic pictorial history of the town for school. And uh, so yeah, I, I would say that that was probably the seed of what I eventually started doing. Right. And, uh, that, that was Val. <laughs> and I, I also had, uh, did you want me to go into my interest in computers before they were <laughs> existed? <laughs> <laughs> we can save that for another conversation, which I think oh, is, like, sure, sure. which is so great, though, so I love that. Um, because like, okay. within that, too, though, like, <laughs> I do want to make like, the one small pitch of sure. if you are watching any of these, please do remember that librarians are there to help. <laughs> always, always ask yes, them. Yes, yes, definitely. I, like, I had the same thing where I was like, I, I, I don't know who these people are. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to ask them this question. Right, it's exactly. ridiculous. So <laughs> just, just ask the librarian for help. They're there to help yes. out. Um, yes, please always help. Please always ask. <laughs> For help. I mean, never hesitate. I uh, wish I had done that sooner. <laughs> right, uh, absolutely the same. Um, so, so is this based on kind of those experiences? Is this what you thought you would be doing when you were in high school? Um, let's see. Not at all, really, because um, I I did love libraries, but I had no idea about the archival profession or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, what I really thought I'd be doing. I mean, I had these vague ideas of wanting to be a writer, wanting to travel around the world, but. I mean, I had no concrete plans as to how I would finance this. And so I, I think realistically, um, I thought that I was just going to work at an assortment of jobs and that I was going to 
just uh, in my free time, read, learn more, and travel if I could afford it. And so, yeah, I don't really have any idea of archival work. Nice. Um, yeah, and I, and I like the, the combination of those answers too, where like, I, I also grew up loving like museums and libraries, but then working at like, a library, like the APS is different level of library and like always thinking about like what yeah. like what different types of these things might mean is, is fun to explore along the way. Um, so uh, moving forward a little bit in time, uh, what were you like in undergrad? Let's see, undergrad, um, when, well, I definitely liked college a lot more than high school. Mm -hmm. um, I liked the ability to be able to choose your courses and choose when you took them, not 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, and um, also, I, I met a lot of really cool people, so I think I was definitely a lot more sociable. Um, then when I was at Temple, I was very involved in like campus activities. I was uh, one of the editors for the school paper and uh, worked at the campus radio station. I was kind of involved in the local music scene through friends of mine. And so it was generally just really a much better time. And um, I took a lot of additional courses I liked taking and worked at a lot of different jobs. So it was a very busy and very exciting time in my life. And yeah, I just didn't sleep very much. <laughs> <laughs> so. Which, you know, happens. Um, yeah. I, I, so I like this kind of the arc that you made between high school and undergrad too, which I think is really important for any viewers in high school to think about where, one, it is important to like get good grades to a degree and like follow the rules and do these things um, that everybody should do in general, disclaimer, exactly. right? But also that sometimes you don't fit within that structure and that's okay. Like undergrad and like, these later life experiences are meant to kind of like pursue your passions, like stay up late listening, going to those like underground shows off campus because it's I, fun, but like also make sure that you're doing your work at the same time because those interests, those experiences are part of what makes you you when you get those careers and move forward. Um, and I think your answers really hint at like that other side of these things of being able to like follow your interests, know what you're interested in, right. have fun, and like as long as you're learning along the way, that's important. And like knowing how you learn when you will learn best are all crucial um, parts of these things. Right. Um, so on a more serious note, what was your major in undergrad? Okay, <laughs> well, let's see. Um, again, long, long story that I'll try to keep short, <laughs> but I had many different majors. Um, I started off as a journalism major at community college. I took some art classes, photography, things like that, but then I switched to liberal arts because it's more transferable in most mm -hmm. cases before school. And when I was at Temple, I started off in anthropology. I was interested in biological anthropology, sort of brain behavior relationships and psychology and all these sorts of things. I even thought about going to medical school, but then dropped that. And then I kind of um, became more interested in social psychology and sociology mm -hmm. and things like that. So um, yeah, so that was my first major. And then I kind of circled back to journalism for a second BA after working for a little bit. And um, eventually into, um, well, that was grad school, history and library science. <laughs> right, right. Which is so great too, though, that like it connects to what you do now where like you get to explore all these vast interests and things like that. So if you are like a, a major hopper, if that's a term, you know, there there still are careers as long as you like move forward with interests. I think it's, it's great to kind of know. Um, so I have a sense of what this answer might be based on um, yes. other things. But is this what you thought you'd be doing when you were an undergrad? <laughs> Um, no, well, no, in the sense that, again, I didn't know about archives, but I, I always kind of, every, and everything was kind of leading in this direction, the more that I think about it now. I mean, certainly mm -hmm. I didn't know that at the time, but for me personally, it was kind of, the foreshadowing was there in the sense that I was always interested in history. Um, even at those colleges, um, I was interested in campus history. I would kind of go down and poke around in the archives. So I knew that archives were there, but they were in the library or in mm -hmm. the newspaper office. So I was always sort of, reading about history in, at some level. But um, I guess I didn't know that there was an actual position other than librarian that involved working with the actual old records, not yeah. just books. Yeah. So. Nice. And, and <laughs> I, I think based on like the conversations we're having in this kind of like season of career chats, it's a good reminder that like, if you find something like in a library or an archive, or if you um, read a book, odds are, there are careers behind those things. So yes. <laughs> like ask around, yes. explore these things as you go, because you never know what kind of like pathways you might find based on those kind of seemingly obvious finds um, a certain degree. So that's that's a good note to think about. Um, and, and so you kind of mentioned this with the with the class that you took in grad school, but would, would you say you have an aha moment with this career trajectory? 
Um, let's see, there were actually kind of a few of them. I mean, when I was working at the newspaper, which I mentioned earlier, um, the big aha moment, I think, for me was when I was called, uh, when I was yelled at at 7 a.m. on the phone by two different political candidates. They were opposing political candidates, and it was just like, in short, I wrote a story about the upcoming election, and both of them thought I favored the other one. So they, you know, I, I just decided at that point, no, I want to write about dead people, not the living anymore. And so I went to, uh, temp I applied to Temple for the Master of Liberal Arts program. And uh, that was the one with the, I guess, the deadline that was soonest. And mm. I just put in my application in July and I was accepted and I started taking history courses. So that was aha moment one, I guess. And that I was kind of like, you know, enough of this. History mm. seems to be the way to go, just based on, I think I came to that realization. And then the other ones were when I was working at the um, Philadelphia City Archives. Um, I, I, when I, once I got there, I got that position through Martin Levitt's Archives class, of course. And um, the uh, first night of class, he asked if anyone would be interested in a career or a, a paid internship. And I was like, well, yes, I would. And my hand went up and I was like, what am I doing? And I don't even know anything about this field. It's the first night. And I mean, that was definitely uh, one of those decisions I'm really glad that I made because um, when I got to the city archives, it was like being in a dream. I mean, here were all these records of Philadelphia history mm -hmm. and uh, family histories or records like the old vital records, things I'd always wanted to research. And I also really became interested in the technology end of things because Jefferson Moak, who was one of the archivists, was working on the Philadelphia Naturalization Database. And I was like, these are records of people who came into this country and, you know, this may be one of the few records that somebody could find about these people. And, you know, just because of my own family background, which I won't get into now, I never thought I would find information, and I did. And so I thought this is a way to make this av information available for people who think they can't find anything. So I would say that that really, um, that's how I became interested in the technology end of mm -hmm. uh, working on archives. So, three aha moments. I, I like yeah. that, though, because there, there are two distinctly kind of um, the more I ask this question, the more I kind of like it for, <laughs> for certain reasons, where like, the yeah. aha moment can be like, nope, this is not the thing for me, but you still don't know what yeah. the next thing is, and that's <laughs> that's really great to know, because um, it's important yeah. to know what you don't want to do and know what you want to do at the same yes. time. Like, those are it, it, important things to know. Um, so on like the kind of professional note, so say I'm a student doing an informational interview with you, do you have questions you love being asked about your job? Anything that I should probably avoid, or um, any email pet peeves of any sort? Um, let's see. Well, I, I just really I love being asked about um, how I got into the field and mm -hmm. what aspects of the work I like, and um, also kind of how we can change our field for the better. Yeah. I mean, that's what I think is really great. Over the past few years, there's been so many, you know, whether students who come in for inter informational interviews or our researchers or new members on staff. I mean, just all of the thoughts they have and perspectives and ideas. So I really enjoy hearing about those things in addition to, talk, you know, just basically talking with people about how we can improve things. So um, I would say in terms of questions to avoid, I mean, there aren't really too many. I'm usually pretty open, maybe sometimes too much so, about myself and my work and, uh, you know, my opinion sometimes. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I'll, I think I'll answer pretty much anything. I mean, I, you know, with the caveat that I really, you know, would have to think about that one on the spot. But for the most part, I'm pretty open and, you know, accepting of questions. So. And that, so, so that's important too, where like during an informational interview or during like any of these settings too, you really do want to think about what questions you're going to ask because one, it's important, like it, like whenever I talk to like anybody else on the staff, like I love just like chatting anyway. So right. I'm, yeah. I'm on board for like a five hour conversation about Lord knows what, but then, you know, if you don't have the time, you have to be able to say <laughs> that I don't right. have the time. So that's exactly. something to know also like for informational interviews where especially in fields like this, we will talk on end about what we do, how we do it, and why we love doing it. So like, just be aware of the time constraints that you might have before going into an informational interview, um, yeah. for better or worse, which is a good point to kind of think about. Um, so that's good to know. Uh, so we'll wrap up section two and move on to the third section where we get to talk a little bit about um, objects that really demonstrate your work. And with yours, kind of like the, the spread interest, it's hard to find one that might really, <laughs> right, exactly. really speak to your work, right? So we'll go into two examples to share my screen, and then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other possible options that you discuss along the way. Um, so first up is the Anthony F.C. Wallace papers um, and that searchable collection. 
Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, the Anthony uh, F.C. Wallace papers, this was the uh, first collection that I worked on at APS. And I was, I'd been at APS about two months, and um, this um, grant-funded project funded by the Mellon Foundation came up. And uh, what, um, what the one kind of odd coincidence was that I had read Anthony Wallace's work when I was in grad school. He wrote a book called St. Clair, which is a study of a town in the Pennsylvania coal region. And my interests in grad school included um, labor history, working class history, women's history, and you know, Irish American history, coal region history. So I read Anthony Wallace's book, but I had no idea that his papers existed, uh, let alone that they were at APS, which is kind of weird and or odd. But, um, and I actually also read some of his work on uh, culture and personality and uh, brain behavior relationships when I was an undergrad. Yeah. So I found out the papers were here. And so I was like, sure, I'll take this position. So um, this was the first really large finding aid I could uh, created. And as you can see, it has several levels, mm -hmm. um, many series, and you have to expand these. Um, you can either click on the series if you see something of interest on the left hand side, or you can expand these uh, menus on the main page. And you can kind of read a little more about the collection creator, in this case, Dr. Wallace. Um, we, you can read a little more about the collection um, at the series level um, and sort of drill down and find information about different topics. Um, all of our finding aids obviously are searchable, you know, key keyword searchable yeah. or from the main search page. Um, and you can also do control F on the page to find different things. Uh, this is this kind of gives you a good idea of the kinds of things I'd like to improve though. I mean, what we do now is if we have something digitized, we link out to it in the digital library to provide that connection. Uh, none of the material that's on the screen at the moment's been digitized. <laughs> right, of course, I <laughs> chose one. <laughs> I, uh, no, that's okay. I know, I'd have to really, I would say the photographs would probably be the ones most likely to be uh, digitized. Um, uh, Anthony Wallace and his father, Paul Wallace, so the, the collection's actually called the Wallace Family Papers, and there's two record groups within that. Uh, they both did a lot of research with indigenous peoples um, and worked with the different communities and there are uh, a large number of photographs in here and so um, a lot of those have been digitized I think they should be anyway <laughs> but uh, so but you can explore that finding it on your own time and as I mentioned before um, uh, Anthony Wallace did a lot of research in the Pennsylvania coal region. He uh, worked in uh, a Pennsylvania mill town called Rockdale out in Delaware County. Uh, did a lot of work with technology and culture, disasters. Um, he was one of the, what they call the expert witness or something like that for the, um, we called it the Indian claim series because that's what he termed it. I mean, certainly today we would probably call it something else. Mm -hmm. um, this is the kind of thing that uh, Senior and a lot of the other staff, you know, are. Um, working on right now, some of our terminology, and you know, as you're, you're familiar with that as well, Mike. And uh, so the Anthony Wallace finding it, I would say that the one thing to consider when you look at it, it was done 20 years ago. And even at that time, my, my boss at the time, the late Rob Cox, had a, an interest in trying to, even then, uh, use the terms that were preferred by communities. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to do that based on the standards of the time, but it really, you know, a lot of our older finding aids do need some updates. I would also make some different processing decisions now. So, yeah. in that in that sense, it's not a, a great example of my current work, but it's it's a, it's the collection that really set the stage for my future mm -hmm. work at APS, which is why I chose this. And it's a great hint at the future too, where like that'll be part of somebody's job, your job, is updating these terms based on the, whatever the next best practices right. are for making yeah. them findable, right? Um, and then you also get to turn this information into like fascinating exhibits um, yes, or digital yes. galleries like this one, which is just so fun. There's one of those photographs, I'm sure. <laughs> I know. My ancestors <laughs> would love this photo. They oh, were called my, some of them were called yeah. mine. So right, right. That's, uh, I love this image. But, uh, it's so fun. And then I'll launch the exhibitions. Like, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's, it's very dated. This exhibit screams 1999 to 2001 in many ways, which is when I created it. But um, Rob, did the uh, visual design for this at the time, and I did the textual, you know, the, um, the research and the textual information. And uh, the reason it's called the old country and the new world, at the time, one of my main interests, it's still an interest of mine, was sort of the experience at the time that many coal miners faced, particularly the earlier ones from Ireland. Um, the conditions in the coal region were not exactly like the ones in Ireland, but it was very similar, you know, the kind of 
um, English background mine bosses versus the Irish coal miners, that sort of thing. And um, so I kind of delved into that a lot. And I used Anthony Wallace's book, St. Clair, as sort of the structure for the exhibit. And then I explored the different themes, which really drew heavily on both his work and then a lot of things that I was reading at the time when I was in grad school and for my own research. So it's, it's still a cool little exhibit. I mean, I don't know. I'm really torn. I'd love to update it, but in some ways it's kind of a, an artifact of its time. But Mike, you would have more thoughts on that, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I love websites like this um, because they, they really do connect like some, <laughs> okay, something, something that I feel like I've also built at some point in time in my life. So I, right. I have a special connection to them. Um, yeah. But yeah, right. Like it is an important thing to at least keep some of it like this so that people can know where it started out. Um, so that's a different, that's another conversation for another time too, right? I'm sure we have plenty of those. Yes. <laughs> uh, so do you want to chat a little bit about some of the other possible things that you were thinking about? Because I think they're fun to just kind of know. Um, right. Sense. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, the, um, I know a lot of my colleagues chose um, actual objects from the collections. And I mean, I'm, this is not to say I don't like the actual objects. I love them. <laughs> but um, when I considered the phrase sort of representative of your work, I was thinking more of the the product of the work, mm -hmm. you know, the collection itself, but also what resulted from it. And um, I would say that in addition to the Wallace papers, um, kind of bringing it into the mid phase of my APS career in the present, I would say the um, just the finding aids in general, particularly the ones that, yeah, the the, the legacy data that we put online. Um, when I came here, we had a lot of legacy data. I mean, we had more not online than online. And most of that was in the form of card, um, manuscript card catalog and these sort of pa these paper inventories, these typed inventories. And I wanted to get all of that data into onto the website so that people could search it. I mean, you know, which makes sense, you know, when you think about it. And, but it was just, it would have been so labor intensive. We had a much smaller staff. And so we were really lucky because in 2009, we were able to take what had been a little pilot project that I, um, a grant proposal I developed mm -hmm. for a course. And um, Martin Levitt, our librarian at the time, had suggested this. So what we, what we did is we developed this pilot project for sending data out to have it digitized, the, card, the manuscript card catalog data. We outsourced the data, we brought some of it back, and we created finding aids from the bottom up. And that expanded into the NEH funded project. They gave us a huge chunk of money, and we were able to hire two project archivists. I supervised this. And we we took the database that was out, that we received with all the data, we ran queries by call number, and we created finding aids from the bottom up, essentially, using that data. And uh, we created finding aids for, I think, I'm pretty sure it was over 200 collections. So that was, uh, I think that, that made a huge impact on what researchers were able to find and what yeah. staff could find about our collections. And um, the other part of that project, I would say, is what we've done during the pandemic, because mm -hmm. all of these paper inventories we had, those were not, you know, those collections right. did not have online inventories. So um, I had fortunately scanned all of these as searchable PDFs during the collection survey long before the pandemic. And so we had all this data and we started keying it in and uh, updating the data and creating authority forms. Authority forms, if you don't know, mm -hmm. if anyone out there doesn't know, it's essentially an established consistent form of a name. So you know that's the person you're looking for, but their dates or other information. So um, so yeah, so I would say that the other part of my work that is really um, the object I would choose would be the uh, legacy data that we created uh, in the form of online inventories. And I love, that. that's another question with that I keep asking and I like the more I ask because I think it gets interpreted in such fun ways where like, yeah, absolutely, an object that does demonstrate your work is, <laughs> are these fine yeah. these collections, right? <laughs> um, so it absolutely makes sense. An object is an open interpretation for so many reasons. Um, and I love that. And thank you for sharing all of that information and making sure that this information is findable on, <laughs> yes. on the website and accessible. Okay. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, and of course, thank you for joining us on Career Chats today, as always. Um, it was a pleasure having you on um, and hearing about your career and learning a little bit more about what you do. Um, so thank you, Val, so much for joining. Oh, yeah. you're welcome, Mike. It's <laughs> been great. So, and I'm always available. If anyone has any questions or wants to follow up on anything, you know, please do not hesitate to contact me. Wonderful. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us on this episode of Career Chats. Remember, we record on Tuesdays and launch them on Thursdays. If you ever have any questions, be sure to check out the webpage and submit those questions in advance. So thank you again, and goodbye from the APS. Okay.